All right, good afternoon. It's always hard to have the lunch, lunch right after lunch slot for sure. So, uh, but it is great to be here in Vancouver. Uh, I'm actually Canadian based in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. My name is uh, Ian Jolliffe and really excited here to be uh, launching uh, Project Starling with the OpenStack Foundation at a Canadian based uh, summit. I'd like to introduce, go ahead, Brent, and introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Brent Rousel. I'm the principal technologist for Wind River's uh, Titanium Cloud. And my name is Dean Troyer, and uh, I work at Intel and am, have been around the OpenStack community for far too long. So if you've been here, you've probably seen me before. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So uh, we're going to start out by setting some context for uh, Project Starling, uh, then talk a little bit about uh, how the project's organized and uh, the launch of the seed code. And then uh, Brent's going to walk you through uh, the architecture in detail, uh, some of the key uh, components and values that Starling brings to the overall OpenStack ecosystem. So we, we really believe, believe in the power of cloud technologies to transform the safety and security of critical infrastructure. So what do I mean by critical infrastructure? Uh, we really haven't spent a huge amount of time focused on what I'll call uh, classical data center topologies. We've really focused things at the far edge of the telecom network, uh, very small uh, single node, uh, duplex node uh, configurations running a full uh, OpenStack cloud uh, in that kind of configuration. And then also what I'll call rack scale architectures as well, uh, running uh, VRAN applications, but also uh, industrial applications. We're seeing uh, medical imaging, uh, being run on, on these kinds of topologies uh, and other uh, automation, uh, virtual PL PLCs, pro programmable logical controllers, and other really interesting and very critical uh, infrastructure projects uh, uh, in, uh, in these new uh, and interesting spaces. So what is uh, Starling X? So it's really a new project that is uh, being hosted by the OpenStack Foundation. Uh, it's been formed with a, a very large seed code, uh, code base from Wind River uh, out of our uh, Titanium Cloud for portfolio of products. It's really going to provide a fully integrated uh, solution that's going to focus on high availability, so 6.9's availability of the underlying infrastructure, uh, extremely high quality of service, uh, performance, and low latency. And we're going to go through exactly uh, how those uh, capabilities are delivered, and some of the uh, projects that will uh, form the, uh, the basis of Starling X along with uh, the upstream projects that we'll be pulling from. And really, uh, the other, we spent the morning with the Acrano team because uh, Acrano will be pulling in Starling X into the overall portfolio as well of the Acrano project. So in terms of the use case here, I touched on it a little bit in the opening. Um, really, this is a proven technology uh, from Wind River. Uh, we've been deploying this for over five years. We've been contributing to OpenStack for five years uh, in Nova, along with SROV into Vitrage uh, with some uh, enhanced fault monitoring, monitoring Masakari, uh, Solometer, and other projects. And now we're uh, really happy to be a bigger part of the overall OpenStack uh, ecosystem and being able to contribute uh, the code to Starling X. We're really focused on low latency, so uh, low interrupt latency into the guest, making sure that we're able to uh, have predictable performance for all the workloads that are run on these, these clouds at the edge of the network. Uh, zero touch provisioning is the buzzword of the day, but really streamlined uh, installation. People actually deploying these very small clouds don't have the IT skill set that uh, might be prevalent in a data center. So uh, really things need to be very simple, easy to consume, and uh, fault tolerant as well. Also, as you move closer and closer to the edge, you have less and less physical security around your cloud. So uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, security capabilities, things like leveraging trusted platform uh, modules. Uh, virtual TPM uh, security as well. Uh, again, uh, IMA support to make sure that uh, you can identify if uh, files have been tampered on the system as well. And really, the other major area is uh, hardware independence. You know, a lot of uh, topologies say, oh, I've got a standard 
hardware topology, really we want to be multi-hardware vendor, hardware agnostic, be able to uh, adapt to NICs being in different slots of different server uh, profiles as well. Uh, we've also been very active in OPNFE over the last number of years, um, have uh, great participation with the OPNFE community on the HA project, along with uh, the OPNFE plug fests where everybody within the OPNFE uh, ecosystem comes together and inter does interoperability testing and brings VNFs or VMs to the party, brings infrastructure software and, and looks at how, uh, how it all works together. And uh, now we have our OPNFE verified uh, certification as well. So I'm gonna do a bit of an overview of the uh, Starling X architecture. Brent's gonna go into more detail, so I'm just gonna hit the highlights. Um, overall, we start obviously with Linux on the, uh, on the base uh, compute nodes in terms of the operating system. Uh, we're leveraging KVM, no big surprise there, but also providing a, a low latency profile that will focus on uh, low interrupt latency and special tunings that, uh, that are uh, uh, leveraged there. From a virtual switching perspective, we're going to leverage OVS DPDK, uh, leverage DPDK, obviously, from uh, originated by uh, Intel, and also uh, SROV is a very uh, important interface type that uh, needs to be supported very well in, in this solution as well. In terms of the cloud control plane, obviously, uh, OpenStack is the base uh, layer, but uh, there's a, a number of extra things that we layer on top of that, and these are going to form the basis of some new projects within uh, Starling X. So things like fault management, uh, service management, so managing and monitoring all the different services on the platform so that you can have asynchronous process failure and automatic recovery. Uh, software management, so uh, we've been focusing on and for the last five years been uh, delivering security fixes uh, to our customers via a patching mechanism, which Brent will go into in more detail along with uh, hitless upgrades. So again, we've been looking at solving uh, the upgrade problem and skipping OpenStack releases and things like that, but also within a very small footprint. So, uh, and then lastly, it's uh, really all about uh, infrastructure orchestration, being able to monitor and detect the failure of a virtual machine in less than a second, automatically recover those virtual machines. Again, we can't have operator interaction to be able to recover uh, problem, uh, prob problematic situations. And lastly, but not least, uh, we'll, we'll be leveraging Ceph for the storage infrastructure across all the uh, different uh, configuration types. So uh, again, I touched on this earlier, but uh, we, we want to be able to have a very small footprint edge solution. Uh, storage, control, and compute, as, along with virtual machines, on a single server. And we call that the Grouse configuration after Grouse Mountain just near uh, Vancouver here. Um, so again, this is not gonna provide you hardware level redundancy, but if a VM fails, uh, you can automatically recover it and it goes back into service very quickly in less than a second. The next scale up is really a, a two node configuration. This gives you uh, hardware redundancy. Uh, you can move VMs around uh, from one uh, node to another. And again, you have uh, storage, control, and compute all on a single node. And then lastly is the larger, largest scale, and Robson is uh, the name for that. And then you'll have dedicated nodes for storage, uh, dedicated nodes for the control plane, and then dedicated nodes for compute. And if any of you are ge geography nerds, the uh, Grouse, Whistler, and Robson are in order of uh, altitude, so uh, that's why we chose those names. Um, the, other, the other big thing here is uh, maybe a little bit controversial, but we've got a, a, in our Robson configuration, we've got uh, a, a uh, active standby uh, controller node topology. Most, uh, most people deploy three nodes. This is all about getting into the smallest footprint possible minimizing the hardware investment, but still being able to scale out your infrastructure. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Dean to uh, talk about the overall project structure and the various projects that we've got. Thank you, Ian. Um, 
the projects that we have, the, the, the service management, configuration management ones across the bottom layer, those are the new, that's the new code that we're bringing um, that was originated with Wind River. We integrate all of those, and in order to implement a lot of that functionality, we have made changes to upstream projects. We've made changes to CentOS. We've made changes to a lot of OpenStack projects. And the intention with the, all along, Wind River has been, I don't know what percentage, you've been upstreaming code for quite a while. Ian since mentioned- Since the beginning. Since the beginning. Ian mentioned some of the other projects that, that aren't listed here that they've contributed things to. Um, with this release, our intention is to take all of that code and everything that makes sense to go up to CentOS, to go up to Ceph, to go up to OpenStack, we're going to try to do. Um, it's been pretty common wisdom for a long time that people who keep private forks, um, most of these are operators, it turns out, uh, wind up with a big pile of technical debt and nobody benefits from that in the end. So the we have some we have some things to think about in terms of the process to how we go about doing this. Um, and for reasons that we don't have time to get into, um, we have a particular structure right now. But the, the goal is we know there's some things that are going to be hard to push around, but there are things that we need to, uh, that we need to move up. That's great. More? OK. So thank, thanks, Dean. Um, so uh, this code will be uh, available very shortly. I, I, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that. I forgot about that. Um, all of the code is actually staged on GitHub right now. Uh, it's available at the Starling X dash staging project on GitHub. Uh, there's about 40 repos there. And that's what's going to get imported if and when it happens. So it's, it's all out to look at right now. Okay. Great, thanks, thanks, Dean. Okay, uh, so I'm going to uh, step you folks through the uh, some more of the uh, the architecture details and uh, also discuss um, where we uh, some short-term things that we're uh, planning on doing with the C drop and some of the visions that uh, that that we have going forward for this project. Okay, so first of all, um, just just go over the uh, the software stack for the uh, for the seed code that we're contributing. Uh, so at so at the bottom, we we're ba we're based on CentOS. Uh, with CentOS, we have a number of different pro uh, profiles to enable different uh, different performance and uh, security features. Uh, next up uh, uh, up the stack, um, we uh, leverage quite a few. Uh, open source uh, projects. Some of those we, we have uh, e extensions and hardening against. And as uh, Dean, uh, Dean pointed out, our, our intent is to to upstream those to the to the appropriate homes. Uh, then, <clears throat> then we have um, some of the, the uh, new projects that we'll be contributing under uh, under St Starling X. So the, these make up our middleware, uh, what we call our middleware components. So fault management, configuration management, host management, service management, software management. And um, in the upcoming charts, I'll go through those in more detail. Uh, the next layer up the stack is uh, OpenStack. So the, uh, so the seed code is based on uh, OpenStack uh, Pike. Uh, we, have quite a, uh, we have quite a few extensions against the, uh, some of the OpenStack uh, projects to uh, to, har to harden OpenStack, uh, to enable performance features, and to enable other, other new functionality. And again, our intent is to upstream those to the appropriate home. Oops. Uh, then we have something called uh, infrastructure or, uh, or orchestration. Um, so again, we'll get into this in more detail, but this, this enables a lot of our high availability um, Functionality that we that we provide with uh, with the seed code. Uh, then, of course, we would on the compute side we would have the virtualization layer, QMU, Libvirt, and lastly, networking. So, uh, high performance networking, OBS DBDK, SRLV, and as well as PCI pass through. 
Um, just going to mention this. Uh, so part of the seed code um, would contain uh, this distributed cloud incubation project that uh, that we started. We have a um, we have a, a forty minute session uh, tomorrow afternoon to uh, to deep dive on this. But uh, just just to give you a flavor for uh, what it's about. So so basically, uh, this this project is is providing centralized infrastructure uh, orchestration and management for uh, for distributed uh, edge clouds. So uh, functionality such as uh, uh, a portal for system wide um, uh, software updates or a portal for system wide uh, configuration deployment and uh, fault monitoring uh, aggregation. So um, if you folks are uh, interested in this, I encourage you to come to our session tomorrow afternoon for more details. And uh, this is something we're really looking uh, to uh, collaborate with the, uh, the, with the community on to uh, uh, move this initiative forward. Okay, um, so I talked about, I talked about the, uh, the seed code. Um, one initiative that we, that we currently have in flight uh, that we will be uh, contributing to the, to the seed code as soon as possible is uh, we're, we're looking to uh, containerize the, the, the infrastructure layer. So the, so the management of the, the platform inf infrastructure services we want to containerize and run under, under Kubernetes. So introducing Docker runtime, uh, Calico CNI, Ceph as the persistent uh, storage backend, Helm as the package manager. And uh, for, the, uh, for the initial uh, implementation of this, uh, the, the targets would be to containerize the OpenStack layer. So we'd be look, certainly looking at the leveraging the OpenStack Helm project to aid, aid in that, as well as the uh, infrastructure orchestration uh, component that I mentioned earlier. We would uh, be looking to containerize that as well. Um, with this, um, there, is the, there would be limited ability to, to also host um, uh, end user applications as we, we would be providing a full uh, full Kubernetes cluster, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll speak more to end user applications uh, a little bit later. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to uh, dive a little bit into a little bit more detail on the seed code itself. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to first of all talk about uh, uh, deployment. So um, our philosophy was to try and keep deployment as, as simple, simple as possible. So after, after uh, planning your cloud deployment, understanding the, uh, the number of nodes, the networking storage requirements that, that you need, uh, and the application dimensioning, uh, you would start off with uh, basically all, all that's required is you need, uh, you need one node, uh, you need one node powered up, uh, connectivity to uh, connectivity to the the BMC, and from there we can ins uh, install the first node either via a Pixie boot server or uh, from a USB. We have no requirement for a separate or, or external uh, uh, de deployer installation node. Uh, then uh, there would be a configuration wizard to bootstrap the system, which can either be done. Uh, feeding in a, an off-box generated configuration file, or, or alternatively, it could be entered uh, interactively. Uh, we provide APIs to do remaining system configuration, REST APIs. And uh, once that's done, you now have a seed node that's up and running as an OpenStack controller. So we've really hidden uh, the internals of how you configure, configure OpenStack to, to the end user. Uh, once that's done, then uh, it can uh, deploy and configure the remaining nodes in parallel from, from this seed node, which is also functioning as an OpenStack controller. So, so, so with this implementation, we really have a, you know, a low-touch low uh, deployment with, uh, with uh, a minimal uh, uh, footprint. Okay, um, so we also, uh, so as part of the, part of the uh, deployment, we have, in, we have inventory and, uh, and uh, nodal configuration. So this, uh, this takes care of the, the installation of the nodes. 
Uh, so we have the ability to, to install, in, install nodes in, in parallel. Uh, we, do, we do full inventory discovery of the, hard, of the hardware, CPUs, memory, uh, storage, uh, and specialized devices such as GB, GPUs and crypto devices. And, and provide um, and provide APIs to configure uh, to configure the uh, the nodes themselves. So what what no, uh, role the node is going to play and the uh, some of the profiles associated uh, associated with that. Uh, and there's also the we also have the framework to be able to uh, bulk deploy the configuration via system profiles. And this is all available via uh, via REST API. We also expose it on the. Uh, Ryzen GUI and a, a system a system CLI. Uh, then we have host management. So this manages the the life cycle of the of the host. Uh, so it uh, it it, mo it monitors various things: connectivity, critical process failures, resource resource utilization thresholds, hardware fault sensors. It takes all that input and. Um, and would uh, automatically handle any any host failures, any host degrade failures, and initiates uh, recovery action. It uh, as part of that. It interfaces directly with the uh, with the board management system, and it publishes the the host state to to other system level services that that need to know the the, the health of the the system to take the appropriate action. Also exposes a set of administrative commands uh, that can be used to. To, uh, for instance, take uh, administratively uh, take the host out of the cluster or bring it back into the cluster. Uh, with this, uh, this this implementation is uh, is is, is uh, purposely been uh, vendor neutral, so it's not tied to any any specific hardware SKUs. Uh, software patching. Uh, so first of all, what is a patch? So a patch can be basically any software update that needs to be uh, that that needs to be de uh, deployed to an operator. So that could be uh, corrective content, uh, which could include stuff like uh, uh, security CVEs, or it could also be new feature functionality. Uh, so with our software uh, with our software patching mechanism, uh, we have a, a consistent mechanism to deploy software updates to all layers of the of the stack, from the kernel all the way up to the uh, to the open stack uh, service layer. It uh, employs a rolling uh, rolling update strategy across the nodes, and where where nodes can also be patched in parallel, assuming certain constraints are are not violated. Uh, two two types of patching: supported in service patching, and reboot patching uh, for for cases where you you cannot do a uh, an in service patch. So. Uh, a great example of that would be I need to update my kernel. For the patches that do require a reboot, the system would automatically uh, migrate VMs off the off of the host being patched before initiating the uh, the reset. So this is all exposed via uh, via REST uh, via REST API, which which provides all the uh, all the commands to do the patching operations as well as uh, providing status both on a system and nodal level. So with this, uh, we, we have a hitless, uh, hitless software patching mechanism that allows us to you know, de deploy content uh, to all la layers of the system. So taking it one step up, uh, software upgrades. So what we mean by an upgrade is it's a full update it's a full update of the ent entire stack. So I'm going to replace my kernel all the way, all the way up to the, to the OpenStack uh, uh, services layer. So it's an integ integrated solution. Uh, it's, it's automated with a, a low number of steps. Um, so it, it, again, it, it does a rolling upgrade. So it would, it would, up, uh, would update the, uh, the controllers with, uh, with the APIs, and then would roll through the uh, compute nodes, uh, uh, upgrading one node at a time or potentially in parallel, depending on uh, the deployment characteristics. As part of uh, upgrading the compute nodes, again, we would uh, uh, automatically uh, migrate uh, work off that comp uh, compute host before, uh, before performing the, uh, the upgrade. 
And underneath the covers, it deals with all the database schema, uh, schema changes and data conversions. So this is all transparent to the, the end user. So um, again, in the same vein as patching, we, we have a HIPAA software upgrade solution. And you know, as Ian mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're in winter of fifth release now. So this is deployed in the field. People, people, people use this. It works. And we, you know, we've we've even done upgrades where we skipped OpenStack releases. We've gone from Kilo to Mataka. We've gone from Newton to Pike. Uh, infrastructure orchestration. Um, so this area is, is responsible for managing and orchestrating uh, the various VM carrier grade and I availability extensions uh, that, we, that we provide. So auto healing of, of, of failed instances. So for instance, if a, a compute node fails, uh, the system will automatically try and uh, evacuate the failed instances uh, to another compatible, uh, compatible compute host. Uh, it also, it also uh, attempts uh, recovery of uh, VMs that uh, fail. Uh, it coordinates the recovery of, of virtual machines in, in the case of a, a disaster scenario. So for instance, you lose power to the rack. Once, once the host recovered, then it, it systematically will uh, recover the, uh, the, the, virtual, uh, the virtual machines. Uh, as part of this, it, uh, there's also a mechanism to uh, to define the recovery order of a virtual machine so you can prioritize high, uh, your important VMs over less important ones, say a, a data plane app versus a, uh, a user interface. Uh, <clears throat> it, um, this uh, so the infrastructure orchestration also orchestrates our guest API. So we provide a guest API uh, which performs a number of functions. One of those would be uh, uh, intrusive monitoring, which, which can range from uh, uh, heart beating to uh, invoking application spe specific health checks. Uh, the the guess the, the client side of this is already is already open is already open source, and this uh, the back end here would orchestrate that. Uh, another another part of that guest API is um, is being able to has uh, been able to inject uh, light, pending lifecycle events into, into the guest. So for instance, the operator uh, initiates a live migration. Well, that, that pending event can be injected into the virtual machine and the virtual machine can you know, take pre-action to uh, before the operation is, is commenced or it could decide to reject it, in which case the operator will get back a, uh, a message saying you can't do that right now. Uh, it's also this component is also responsible for raising clearing alarms about instances and uh, generating logs. Uh, it orchestr for for administrative actions I mentioned in the host uh, management before we, we do provide a uh, a way to administratively remove nodes from the cluster. So it, it would interact with this with this orchestration to in, uh, initiate the live migration of those hosts off the. Uh, off the uh, off the compute host, um, and last but not least, this component also uh, orchestrates software patching and upgrades of hosts. And that's the next chart. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I talked about patching upgrades. What what this component does is it automates uh, it automates the, the the patching and and upgrades across the system. So basically, it's uh, you, you define what we call a strategy, push a button, and then it will just roll out the either the patch or or invoke the upgrade across the system. Uh, performance features. So I'm not going to go through all these, but um, just want to touch on a couple. So uh, compute node performance profiles. Uh, so we have different we have different performance profiles. And that uh, that can be that can be installed on a compute host, and basically the operator can select the performance profile that best meets the, the uh, their workload requirements. Part of that would be the, the next bullet uh, optional uh, real-time KVM support. Um, under 
support various uh, EPA features. I'll just touch on a couple, uh, so VPU scale up and scale down. So this is the ability to add, uh, uh, add vCPUs to, to a guest VM on the fly. Or, and lastly, uh, uh, Intel's uh, RDT uh, uh, cache allocation technology, which, which, enables, um, which enables an application to uh, reserve a slice of the uh, last level cache, generally the L3 cache, uh, to, uh, to protect them against noisy neighbor scenarios. <laughs> So with, with, all these, with all these performance features, we can deliver predictable performance at the edge. Um, just going to quickly touch on this, so uh, security. So security really, really starts at the bottom, from, at the physical layer, and, and there's uh, components, attributes of security all the way up to the, the guest application. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list of security features that we provide, but just want to touch on some key ones. Uh, so some, some day zero stuff, so uh, our build and software delivery, so uh, ISO, ISO images and patches are, are signed and verified on application. Uh, support for UEFI, secure boot, and TXT boot. Uh, we also optionally support um, uh, integrity management architecture. Uh, IMA, so that this this um, this provides a mechanism to ensure that your f uh, the files on the system have not been have not been tampered with. Uh, TPM in integration, so we have integrated uh, uh, TPM. It's an optional capability, and currently um, we use it to store uh, store and access uh, uh, private keys. And in the same vein, we also support uh, virtual TPM integration. So this is a software-based um, implementation which can expose a, uh, what appears to the guest to be a, a virtual a TPM to the guest, but from a guest perspective, it operates the same way as a, uh, a TPM 2.0 device would on bare metal. So, so all this is, you know, providing critical security infrastructure for the edge. Okay, so uh, a, a pivot to uh, I talked about what this uh, talked about some of the stuff in the seed code. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our vision for for future collaboration with uh, with the community. So I touched on uh, we're you know we are already doing some work with uh, with containers, but we we really see uh, VMs and bare metal containers as being first class citizens uh, that meet the performance, latency, and reliability uh, requirements of the edge, and being able to coexist with uh, with VMs in in a single deployment. So as as part of that vision, it's uh, you know, first of all on the infrastructure side, we need to complete the. Uh, uh, complete the uh, containerization of the of the infrastructure itself, and then we need to look at the full support of uh, of, applic of application uh, workloads. Uh, so certainly certainly more than this, but some of the key points would be accelerated container networking. So uh, with uh, with both SRLV and OVS DBDK, multi tenancy support. And, and also supporting additional uh, runtimes, including uh, including CATA containers. Uh, uh, we 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 also uh, we also think that uh, um, we mentioned earlier that uh, we're currently based on CentOS. Uh, we think uh, we need a more diverse uh, ecosystem, so Ubuntu OS support. Uh, can, uh, Deploy, a deployment simplification at the edge is certainly an extremely important topic. So continuing to work to simpl simplify that. Uh, I touched on earlier our distributed cloud work. So uh, centralizing infrastructure management of edge deployments. Uh, secu securing the edge. One, um, and one area there would be uh, implementing remote attestation. Uh, PTP and TSN support. And, uh, working and um, working with uh, with the community to drive synergies with uh, EdgeX, uh, NEV, uh, SDK within the within the Acrano project. And lastly, um, 
all the, uh, a lot of the previous bullets co contribute to this, but uh, enabling uh, 5G use cases at the, at the edge VRAN. So that's the uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay, questions? If you could use the mic, that would be great, or I can repeat your question. It's not going to be so much of a merger as taking the pieces that we've been that we've done so far and submitting them. I mean, just like any other feature work, you know, if there's if there's something to support TSN that we need in Neutron, we're going to submit that as a feature to Neutron and work it through the system. That's right. It's not it's not a, a mashing together. Indirectly, we will because internally the build builds RPMs for everything. So the the spec file and everything to build such an RPM will be in the code. I have no idea. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, uh, no, it, uh, yeah. So so currently, um, live migration is only supported with a, a virtual switch. Uh, in, that, in that case, if you're using uh, SRLV, that they would currently be cold migrated. Yeah, all those limitations still apply. Yeah. Exactly. It depends on what stage in the upgrade. Okay. The, 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 Uh, again, if you pass the point where you committed the upgrade, then no. There, yeah, there's a point at which that yeah. becomes a restore operation. Yeah, but 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 generally, uh, as as you do the upgrade at uh, points along the way, you would you would ensure that the that the uh, the the payload is is still functional. So you know, one one key point there would be after after I switch the APIs over to the uh, to the N plus one load, you would that's probably you would want to verify that yep my my workloads are still good. One last question, I think. That okay. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Um, well. I, uh, so I have a s really short answer. I guess we see uh, a Crano pulling from Starling X and it being part of uh, a Crano as part of yeah. the, the wider suite of things that a Crano is yeah. offering. It's just another use case within the Crano, like the NEV SDK or some of the other uh, things that are being yeah. talked about. Yeah, I mean, th this morning, the, you know, the concept of blueprints uh, was discussed. I would, see, um, I would see Starling X as a blueprint that would feed into a Crano. Well, thanks, uh, everybody, for uh, joining us this Thank afternoon, you. right after lunch. Uh, please come join uh, the Starling Next project. We're really looking to bring people in, into uh, this exciting area at the edge of the network and, and uh, in industrial applications as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, folks.